Oh, it's very nice to be here. Thanks for the invitation and the, and a chance to both think and reflect a little bit on our experiences in, in the Women's Magic Group in the UK. I've never actually talked about the Women's Magic Group really before. Not, well, not for many years. Um, and uh, so it gave me a chance to think a little bit about um, what we've been doing and how things have changed over the years. Um, I've got four things that I'd like to talk about. Um, one is really what we mean by gender responsive budgeting. There are a lot of terms, and I won't be consistent with what I call them, but gender budgeting, gender responsive budgeting, something like that. And then I want to talk about a little bit about the UK Women's Budget Group. Um, and then I would quite like to talk about methods of gender equality impact assessment, give some examples of what we've done. Now, I can go on forever about this, and I've probably got far too many slides on this area, so this is the area where I'm going to, going to cut things short if I'm going on a bit. And then um, the people in the Treasury who I'm going to talk to yesterday said I should talk about some, le some lessons from the UK in European experience. It feels to me terribly arrogant to do that, but I've prepared some so I can try them out on you and you, <laughs> you can tell me about them. Um, all right, I'll get started then. Um, so, gender responsive budgeting. Well, I, I was involved recently, actually it's not my latest book, because there's a book that's just come out this week that I've contributed to on gender budgeting in Europe. I can't even tell you the title, but it's in the same series. It's the um, International Association for Feminist Economics series that's, that's um, edited by Routledge. And this book is, is edited by Elsa Mackay and Elizabeth Klatzer. Um, and we had a debate in writing this about um, what was meant by gender mainstreaming. And this is the one that I quite like. I know that the editors don't particularly like it, but I hope that I've dealt with their objections in this. But So what I think of it is as, as a form of gender mainstreaming, making sure that everything goes through a gender lens. So applied specifically to fiscal policy. And when you say it's applied to fiscal policy, that includes, therefore, the financing of all other programs, whether they're gender specific or not. So it's very broad. I mean, it could be as broad as gender mainstreaming itself, if you see what I mean. Um, so it means taking into account the impact on gender equalities of policies and the resources devoted to implementing them. So, and one of the things I really want to stress is that it means assessing the impact of such policies on a range of gender inequalities. People often think of gender, gender inequality as just one thing, and it isn't. There are a whole range of gender inequalities, and that's one of the reasons why I get obsessed a bit with this assessment issue, and why, which we'll talk about later. It's important when arguing for it and when doing policy analysis to recognize that impacts on one gender inequality might go one direction and impacts on another gender inequality might go in a different direction. But the other thing that's really important about gender responsive budgeting is that you do something about what you found. So it's not only doing some assessment, it's act acting in response to that assessment. Um, so it's not just a method of policy assessment, of pol but a policy improvement. There are basically two, hello, there are basically two types of arguments for gender responsive budgeting. One is to do with equality, that it's a way of promoting gender equality. But there is another argument, it's actually talked about less, but actually probably more, more influential, is an efficiency argument, that any policy is the, the impact of a policy is often different for men and women, and so they react differently to them. And without a policymaker knowing about these different impacts, those, their policy may be poorly targeted. And that's true whatever their goals are, even if they're to things you would really disagree with. It might be true that, that somebody could implement a policy much more efficiently if they thought about the gender impact first. Um, and there's also a part of the efficiency argument is that you may be inadvertently increasing gender inequalities that are themselves inefficient in those terms. Now, governments are often more interested in the efficiency arguments. They may not be very explicit about that, 
And in fact, they may, without recognising it, already be doing some gender budgeting because they're concerned about that. So, for example, the European Employment Strategy, so um, overall policy agreed by the whole of the European Union in the early 1990s, was focused on a method of um, increasing resources to fund social programmes was to increase the employment rate of women. So it had a specific policy to do that. And that was, if you like, a form of gender budgeting um, to recognize um, that it's any policies that it implemented, it was particularly interested in it, their effects on women, the activation policies, as they were called. Now, that argument for gender responsive budgeting depends on that difference between men's and women's economic position and behavior being structural. It's not just a matter of personal preferences. So the argument why we need gender-responsive budgeting is that women don't just happen more frequently to be taking responsibility for children or for others needing care. Um, it's that the gendered norms and opportunities structure the roles and opportunities of both sexes. So it isn't just, oh, women like to look after children and men don't. Um, but one of the effects of that, and therefore they, they structure not only gender relations in society, but an awful lot else. And therefore it's not surprising that when you do other things, they have an impact on gender inequalities. And that there are very many of them and they're interconnected. And so that's what, so gender responsive budgeting is considering those many interconnected gender inequalities. So the aim of gender responsive budgeting is that policymakers should take into account the impacts of their policies, choosing ones that reduce inequalities. And they can do that on both equality and efficiency grounds. Or if they have goals that they can't achieve without worsening those gender inequalities, they should do something about it. They should mitigate, they should bring in other policies to mitigate those effects. So that whole package is what one would mean by gender responsive budgeting. And analysis and the action on the basis of that analysis should be done at all stages of policy development. So when their policies are first being formed, when they're being implemented, when they're being monitored, and then adapted in the light of experience. Um, now, I'm, I have no expertise in this, in that actual process of when do you do what, uh, because I, I'm part of an you know, outside government body. We haven't been let into the process of government in that sense. But the Scottish Women's Budget Group um, were actually asked by the Scottish Executive when they first started um, to have a look at their budget process, to look at wh which points would be good points to think about gender implications. That's one of the advantages of a small country with a new government. Um, so I'm going to talk, because I don't have much experience of that actual politics of that and the process stuff, more about the methods and potential use of analysis. And in fact, that's been my organization's main involvement. So what are we? Um, we're an independent network of feminist economists, researchers, policy experts, and campaigners, we're all sorts of people. We're mostly women, but not entirely. Um, one of the most active members is, in fact, a man. Um, and what we share is that we're all com committed to pro promoting a gender inequality, gender equality, and I put in at a societal level, because it's not so much, you know, how do you negotiate with particular employers, but what sort of policy change would we like? Um, and we have a focus on analysing the gender implications of economic and social policies. So there are a number of women's pressure groups, if you like, in, in Britain, but we're the one with the focus on analysing economic and social policies. So holding government to account for its, the gender outcomes of its policy, encouraging the government to carry out such analysis itself and use it in its own policy formation. We also assess the government's published attempts to carry out equality impact analysis, and we comment on those. So not only on the policies, but also whatever they've said or done about gender impact assessment. And we spend quite a lot of time trying to improve our own methods of gender impact, gender equality impact analysis. And I'll talk a little bit about that 
Thanks, Ron. Now, we're an organisation with, on paper, 400 members. And what that means is that we have a lot of goodwill. There are a lot of people who are interested in what we do and have signed up at some point onto our mailing list. We don't have a formal membership, so actually talking about that as a member doesn't really mean very much. But um, within that, we have a policy advisory group. Now, this I wrote some time ago. It's not 20 members. It's actually quite much larger now. And these, these are the group of people who actually carry out the analysis each time we have a budget or we have a number of what are called fiscal events. Um, and in the UK, rather peculiar system, it actually might have it in, the, in New Zealand because a lot of New Zealand is based in the UK. But we have one time in the year, we have something called the budget. And it isn't quite what other people would mean by the budget because it's, all, it's largely about taxes. It's about the state of the economy and the taxes that are raised. Something, little bits about ben benefits and very broad outlines of how money might be spent. But the actual expenditure is announced at a different point during different point in the year, and not every year either. It can be you can have a spending review that lasts a few years, and that's called comprehensive spending review. So those are two different fiscal events. We also now have financial statements that come out sort of in between budgets, um, and may announce some policy thoughts or they're supposed to be trailing things but actually I mean trialing things to get responses there actually tend to actually be things that have already been decided so that's we we always respond to those sort of things um, we also sometimes respond to government consultations but we do that only as and when we can because we don't actually manage to do it we don't we can't do it to everything um, and we work basically by, on these big fiscal events, we work by getting members to write about their own area of expertise. So we will get everybody to write a paragraph or two about their area of expertise and what came up in the, in the fiscal event on that area. Um, we've recently changed to a slightly different method of procedure, which I, we, we think is working better, which is that we get people to write about the issues in their area of expertise before the budget or whatever it is we publish those or don't publish we sometimes publish we publish certainly a summary of those as a sort of ask what we'd like in the budget and then we, re we respond with a much shorter document afterwards we used to produce a very lengthy document after the budget but we found we took too long first of all we took too long doing it and nobody was interested in the budget anymore uh, but also it got very repetitive so when if you write with these short we produce these short briefing papers before the budget and now a shorter thing afterwards. Um, we've for many years been completely unfunded, um, just entirely working on volunteer labour. But actually now we're quite well funded um, through a number of outside bodies giving us money. Um, so we've now got a director and two part-time assistants. What, of course, it means is that we have to do some work for that funding. So we do other things besides our core activities. Um, it's quite difficult, as, as I'm sure you all know, to get money for, for, core, for core activities. Though, we, in fact, we have actually got some now from the Open Society Foundation. Um, so the pro bono contribution of all our expert members and friends is still absolutely key. And we, we couldn't run without that. That's, that. that's the thing that we do that nobody else does basically. We're now getting our analysis quite regularly cited in parliamentary debates by academics um, and by other NGOs and in the media, but that took, that took some time, it's now, but now we're quite regularly cited, whether it has much effect is a different matter. Um, and the other thing we do is we try to help build the capacity of women and women's groups to participate in debates about economics and budgeting. So we would help other women's organisations prepare their submissions if something comes up in their area that's particularly about economics. And we've also run training workshops. Um, so we were founded in 1989. I wasn't around then, so... Um, but I found, first found the organ 
the organization for myself in the early 90, in mid 1990s, uh, when the BBC rang me up and asked me some question about the economy. And I didn't know the answer, but I said I'd try and find out. And I found this very small group that was diligently working away, analyzing the effect of every budget. Um, and um, it had turned out that it had managed to talk to John Major when he was Chancellor of the Exchequer, something we've never managed since. We've never actually directly, as an organization, talked to a Chancellor. Um, anyway, what they used to do was to send comments on the gender equality epic impact of budgets to all MPs, um, and they were sometimes used in questions by the opposition, not very much, and sometimes um, we were consulted by the media. So the B one year we were flavour of the year by, with the BBC, so they set up studios to watch us watching the budget. Um, <laughs> they, they, you know, and then, then there was another gimmick the next year. Um, so, um, so that was really what happened until, oops, until in 1997 we had the election of a Labour government, and that was a government that that was actively keen to consult with women's groups. Um, it had an organisation. Actually, thinking about it, I don't know whether it set it up itself or it exi already existed. Called the Women's National Commission, and that was a very handy organisation. It was a a body that was set up specifically to coordinate the activities of women's groups and, to, and enable them to feed into government. It had a, um, a director who was a paid civil servant who um, um, facilitated that. And she was quite very keen on the women's budget group as we were almost the only people who commented on economic policy at all. Um, and so he facilitated a number of contacts for us with, with both ministers and officials. We also made a specific intervention very early in the course of that government, which sounds actually quite similar to something that's going on, that some of the debates that you're having in New Zealand now. And this was what we called purse-to-wallet intervention, which was that a new thing called a tax credit was being set up, called the Working Families Tax Credit, which would give money to... Um, means-tested um, extra support to families that had somebody in employment. So the idea was to encourage um, families to have at least one person in employment, and it was to counteract the fact that the um, income support system, if you were unemployed, if you had a, quite a large family, you'd get quite a lot of money. So the the extra from going into work wasn't very much. Um, and in order to increase that as a work incentive, um, the idea was to, f to give money to families. And Gordon Brown, who was Chancellor of the Exchequer, was very keen that this be seen as a work benefit, an employment benefit, not welfare. Or um, And so it was called a tax credit, even though in all technical terms, by the meaning of a tax credit, in UK language, at any rate, it isn't one. Um, it's a benefit. And um, the, so the plan was to pay it all through the wage packet. And we objected to this. So we, wrote, we had a me held a meeting near Parliament um, to which we invited MPs and, and we invited a minister to come and speak, and a Treasury minister to come and speak at it. Um, and actually, the morning that we had our meeting, the policy changed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and it was changed to one where the family could decide who got the, who got the tax credit. Um, in fact, it has since then, the whole tax credit system has been reformed, so there is a working part of it and there's a child part mm -hmm. of it. And the working part of it goes to a wage earner and the child part of it goes to... Uh, uh, goes to the main carer, so called. Um, but it seemed to me, it seemed to us that we'd um, had a little bit of impact. Whether we actually had, we don't know. Um, so relations with that Labour government, we, we had regular-ish meetings with the Treasury ministers and officials. We shared our analysis of what had been proposed, enacted after the event. Um, again, especially after they regularly brought in after them. We were sometimes 
Again, we were sometimes flavour of the month and sometimes weren't. And we always assumed that there was something going on in internal treasury politics that we didn't know about that determined how much people wanted to speak to us. And we, were, we, felt, we, we thought that we were a bargaining chip a bit, but it was all right. I mean, it got, it got, us, got us in there. I mean, in fact, it got us in there better than the women's equality um, unit itself. Uh, so we actually had to ask for them to be brought along to, to meetings. Um, and we were also consulted over some particular issues, um, usually at very short notice on things we hadn't really thought about. Um, so, for example, the taxation of child benefit. Um, we were brought in and asked, you know, here are three, four, no, four possibilities, what do you think of them? And in the end, they dropped the idea. Um, <laughs> And we got invited to some more general advisory meetings with representatives of other think tanks and other women's orgs. So, for example, we were consulted about the design when they reformed the tax credits, we were consulted. And I think we probably did have some influence on that. We also were asked to provide training days for Treasury officials on how to do gender budget analysis. And there was a pilot product, project called Gender Analysis of Expenditure Product project in which the Treasury, in collaboration with the Women in Equality Unit, looked at particular expenditure programs. This was, they took, they, they took particular examples and did some analysis. I have to say that nothing very much happened as a result of this. Um, I don't think it was, I wasn't involved myself, so I may, I may be only talking about its impact, you know, for, out, for those people who weren't involved, but it didn't seem to have a huge, huge impact, but I can certainly put you in touch with people who are more closely involved um, to, uh, if you want to talk about that. So the impact in that period, well, it's hard to assess. I think we did have some effects on some specific policies. Um, we were definitely more successful when what we wanted was in line with existing government priorities. So they were very keen, as lots of governments were at that time, in raising the overall employment level. So anything that we said that we thought about get more women into jobs, and after all, we weren't against that, um, we got much more response to than, for example, things about improving conditions of stay-at-home carers. Um, I think we probably did help focus minds on the need to consider the gender implications of government policy. Um, but of course it could be we didn't, and the main effect was simply that we helped them improve their presentation. Um, I'm certainly sure we did help them improve their presentation. Um, and we had no success at all in trying to persuade the Treasury to publish any gender analysis. And I think that's quite an that's impo important aspect of this, that we didn't succeed in that. Um, but what we were more successful is that along with other women's groups, we did influence the 2010 Equality Act um, and put in it and get put into it a public sector equality duty. And I'll tell you about that now. Um, in 2000, the 2010 Equality Act basically got rid of the Gender Equality Act, the Race Equality Act, and all those, and put them, put them all into one um, umbrella Equality Act. I can't say that I think that in itself was a great success, um, but there are aspects of the um, Equality Act that, that have been successful. The reason I say that I don't think putting the whole lot together was that there are a lot of specificities of gender that have got we can still raise, but it's not quite as easy as it was when there was a specific um, equal opportunities, specific equal opportunities legislation. Um, I don't know that that's, that's the case always, that it's not a good idea to put all the equalities together. I can see some advantages in doing it. Um, and there have been some advantages for us too. Uh, but I just am aware that First of all, gender can get a bit eclipsed by other inequalities, but also that some of the special things to do with, say, care or other things might get a bit lost. Um, but what the, and part of the Equality Act 
um, is that, it's, that it says there is a duty on public sector organisations to promote equality. So a positive duty, not a, not a defensive one. So it has to have due regard to the need to eliminate all forms of discrimination, harassment and victimisation that is prohibited by or under this Act. And this Act um, talks about a, a, a list of protected characteristics. So gender is one of them, um, race is another, age is another. And you cannot, you're not, it's illegal to discriminate, har harass or victimise people if they have a protected characteristic. Um, to advance equality of opportunity between persons who share a relevant protected characteristic and those who do not share it, and to foster good relations. Um, this was almost the last act passed by the Labour government uh, before it lost power. Um, and it's probably, it's, not, it, it's, it's a lasting memorial to that government. Um, however, it didn't get a chance really to implement it, and that's a real pity because it could have set the, set the tone in the way it was implemented. Um, and subsequent governments have weakened both its scope and its requirements. They've weakened the scope because they took a socioeconomic characteristics or one of the protected characteristics, and they've taken, taken that out. Um, so you can basically do anything you like to poor people. Um, and it's also, they also have also weakened its requirements. Um, and there have been quite a bit, so with less um, favourable governments, um, there has been quite a debate about whether do we really need this? What does it mean anyway? Um, is it necessary? And much of the debate has turned on that phrase of what due regard means. So we've had some court cases over it, um, and they have established, first of all, that decision makers need to be aware of the duty, and they need to show that they're aware. So they need to keep re records of how they've had due regard to equality. They have to gather and consider evidence. Um, they have to consider equality in proportion to the likely equality impact of a policy. What that means really is, is don't treat it as a tick box, act, tick box activity. You know, there are certain things where this really matters. Take it seriously. Um, consider how to eliminate or mitigate in, against any identified negative impact. That's a very important thing. So that your duty is not just to, to, to to try and put in a place policies when they posit, have a positive or reduce gender inequality, it's also to do something about policies that increase it, um, and then resource it properly. And that's again an important part of the. I'm not. I I know almost nothing about the law, so I can't I can't tell you much more than this about about these course cases. Um, and they've also clarified that the duty applies before a decision is taken, not enough after um, the decision has been made. It's ongoing, just that, so it also applies when the policy is being implemented and has to be exercised in substance, not enough to tick boxes, and can't be delegated. And that's really important in, in the current climate where there's outsourcing and privatisation. Um, we'll see it's also important within government, in fact. However, despite all this, Conservative ministers have continued to argue that it doesn't require formal equality impact assessment. David Cameron, in fact, specifically said we're not, you know, not going to be bound by that. Um, and the Treasury has itself carried out assessments that are either absent, completely abs absent, despite this requirement, or of astonishingly poor quality. So this is, this is one of when, they, when there was a cut in fuel duty. Mm -hmm. This was the uh, equality impact wow. statement that went that went with it. So a complete misunderstanding of what the meaning of 
and equality impacts assessment is. Um, so, after passing this law, we had a change of government. Um, so 2010 to 2015, we had a coalition government, which was basically a conservative government tempered a little bit by uh, the, the influence of Liberal Party. And the Liberal Party, in theory, would be quite in favour of this sort of stuff, but it's also a sort of small government party. So it's, that's a little cat both ways a bit. And now, since 2015, we've had a straight Conservative government. We've had no official contact with the government at all since then. Um, the public sector equality duty has been weakened, but it is still in force. And interestingly, it was used by Theresa May, because she, she was the first Minister of e for Equalities. And she reminded the Treasury of the need that they should pay attention to equality impact when they were drawing up their, they had brought in an emergency budget as soon as they got power. Um, and she, it was she who reminded them that they had to pay attention to equality impact in that emergency budget. Nevertheless, and this is not our, our analysis, but that by the House of Commons Library showed that of the net expenditure savings, that was a, this was an austerity budget, um, brought to, um, for fiscal consolidation reasons, it showed that 81% of the, the net savings due, due to the tax and benefit changes that were being brought in would come from women. In fact, it's now, if you now continue that analysis up to the, up to today, you'll see it's 86% by now. Sorry, can, I know the economist at all. Can you explain to me? What that means is that if you look at the, there were a number of changes in taxes and benefits rules brought in by that government, um, like getting rid of a particular form of maternity pay. Now, that 100% of that came from women. That was completely obvious. Um, but it also cut some rates of um, payments to the unemployed. Um, and I don't, I don't know about that specific one, but what you would look at then for that one is, well, what proportion of the people are going to be impacted by this and then and what proportion women and then calculate that percentage. Um, it, it also brought in some changes that went in the other direction. So it, it brought, it raised the, the um, boundary at which you start paying tax, the, the personal allowance, the threshold at which you start paying income tax. Um, and that would go slightly more to men than to women. So we could, you, if you added it all up and calculated it, it turned out that 81% of the, the net change was coming from women and the rest from men. Um, but the Treasury also used the public sector quality to remind local authorities and, and spending ministries of the need to pay attention to equality impact. So the Treasury didn't want to do it itself, was, was very, well, it did, I'll tell you where it did it and where it didn't do it. But it did use its own power to remind local authorities and the ministries that were going to spend money that they had to pay attention to the public sector equality duty. In the UK, local authorities are largely funded from central government. They, they raise um, local um, council tax too, but particularly for the poor authorities, a very large proportion comes from central government. And one of the biggest cuts brought in, in not, not in that emergency budget, but in the spending review later that year, was um, um, was to um, was in its spending on local authorities. I'm going to speed up. Um, so the only thing that the Treasury actually took responsibility was for individual tax <coughs> changes in taxes, and they were all statements like the one I showed you before. For, they, didn't, they didn't do any cumulative assessment, they didn't look at anything about what they did together. Just for an individual tax change, they would produce a statement like that. Some of the statements were more meaningful than that. 
Um, some of them said, you know, this 80%, they, they, they might do a calculation of how many men and how many women, or they might do a qualitative statement about it. Um, and um, it was quite clear that there was no oversight of it. It was, wasn't taken seriously enough that anybody looked over those equality and practice statements. So anyway, we, we at the time were improving our methods of gender equality and practice. So we offered to, offered to help the government with theirs, but we didn't get any response to that. Um, there were a couple of legal challenges on a gender framework. The Fawcett Society, which is the leading um, gender pressure group in the UK, um, asked for a judicial review of the budget on the grounds that the um, using the PSED, uh, and we helped with the provision of evidence for them. It was the government basically they, they we didn't get a judicial review because it had taken six or seven months to get to that point, and the court said, "Well, it's no point now." Um, on the other hand, they clearly wrapped the treasury over the knuckles for not having done it. Um, and then the Equal Equality and Human Rights Commission investigated whether the government had fulfilled its obligations in its 2010 spending review. Um, that was in general with respect to all protected characteristics. Took two years to report, um, found that the government had fulfilled its duties in some respect and not others. Um, and the government agreed to work with the Equality and Human Rights Commission on how to improve its methods of fair financial decision making. And that's one of the one of the EHRC advisory groups that I'm on. So I've worked. So um, it's an ongoing process. This. Um, so we haven't really had any impact since 2010 on government. Our methods of analysis have improved. And it, that includes quantitative analysis, and I think that's quite important. Um, we've had help from friendly analysts. Like if, you, if I've got a moment, I'll show you some of that. Um, we've found that quantitative impact is much, more, much better at grabbing attention than qualitative. Austerity has made gender and other equality impacts much more salient politically. Um, and so those shocking initial figures you know, did did hit the did hit the headlines, but what we find increasingly now is that everybody expects austerity to hit hit women more, um, and that doesn't so much hit the headlines. On the other hand, there has been a backlash against the inequality more generally, and um, we we'll have to see what happens. Um, one other success is that other think tanks have become more interested in gender impact. We're the only ones who's consistently writing about that, but others now mention it. Uh, and we've continued to criticise the government for its failure to carry out good equality impact assessment. Um, so our strengths and challenges, well, the strong strength of the range of members' expertise, um, but without resources or professional help, we couldn't fill the gaps in our analysis. So we, so I think uh, what we produced was always a bit bitty. Um, we couldn't do quantitative analysis. We, could, we didn't have the resources to generate a media profile for ourselves. And our output definitely looked less professional than that of other think tanks. And it also limited the sort of partnership activity that we could do. With some resources, we've been able to be much more comprehensive and also res respond in a more timely manner. We can actually pay for some economic modelling and we have a much better media profile and opportunities for partnership working. Um, I'm going to just skip those sides because I'm running out of time. I just want to say something about the principles of gender equality impact assessment. I think it's really important to look at so these are some that we've developed over time. You should look at the impacts on individuals as well as households. Um, that's because interests within households may differ, um, but policy may also affect decision-making power within households. So you need to take account of that. The policy doesn't just impact on a household. You should take a lifetime perspective wherever, wherever possible. Long-term effects may well outweigh current impacts. 
um, for example, the effects on women's lifetime earnings um, and therefore their pensions um, might be not very good for policies that benefit single earner families. So if you, a woman in a single earner family may think that a policy is really good for her, but if the, if the effect of that is to keep her out of the labour market for longer, in the long term the benefit, the, it will, will not benefit her. Um, take account effects on the unpaid economy. So in particular, thinking of just getting more women into employment and then it, it, it's not a free good. There's, there's fiscal benefits that arise from that. Um, at least some of that money needs to be spent on replacing the unpaid care work that women are doing. Um, look at differences within men and when within women wherever salient, for example, by race and income. Um, it's, a, it's important to do that, but don't not do it because you can't do it. I mean, don't, don't not do the gender impact because you can't break it down further. Quantify wherever you can, but if you can't, the fact, most important thing is not to assume equality where you know it doesn't, where it, you know it is, things are not equal. Um, so qualitative arguments about the direction need to be taken into account too. Um, I would have liked to have shown you some examples. Um, I'm just going to quickly show you that one. This is gendered. <coughs> these are gendered household types. This is what I meant by doing analysis by gendered household types. Anything that you can see that you, you see in the papers or anywhere else done by quintiles or any other breakdown can be done by this, using this type of breakdown by literally pressing a button. So it's an easy type of analysis to do. I can help any of you who want to do that at any time with doing that. So you can see that the effects of austerity impacted particularly on lone mothers, but within any group, these are people, single people without, these are people without children. It was single women who did worse than single men and worse than couples. And similarly true with among pensioners. This is men and women within the same household income bracket. Um, this would look even more extreme if you looked at it um, within married couples alone. So this is their individual income. Now this is a different type of inequality because individual income is a measure not of living standards but of your fiscal, your financial autonomy or your power over household resources. So the, doing this type of analysis is really important as well as that household analysis. But it's not important because it tells you more about living standards. It tells you something quite else. And that's important that there are many inequalities. And you should look at, look at other ones. This is showing that you can break down. Um, we looked at white, black, and Asian women and what specifically happened to women and men and who was impacted most by austerity measures. Um, and we looked at similar, it's used similar methods to look at some particular change. I can let you have these slides um, later. Um, but it's also important, we thought, to show other gender effects of policy. And one of the things we're, we've always argued for is that spending on social infrastructure should be seen as just as important as on physical infrastructure. Um, and we should see it in that we should, it should be seen in the same terms. And there is a male bias in counting physical infrastructure as capital spending, while social infrastructure is seen as current spending. And the male bias is firstly that women have strong, exist strong interests in the existence of high quality social infrastructure, but they're also more likely to be employed in it. And we did a study for the International Trade Union Confederation about the effects of spending a certain amount of money 2% of GDP in various countries on either physical or um, either physical infrastructure, something like construction or on care. And we find in all countries, is the nearest one to you, um, that you, you generated far more employment by spending it on care than on construction. And of course, you generated far more jobs for women 
than for men. So if you're going to bring in a stimulus policy, if a government's going to bring in a stimulus policy, first of all, it needs to do a gender analysis to see what sort of stimulus policy. But if it decides to go ahead with doing a construction policy, it has to put in, it should be putting in mitigating, other mitigating policies to take account of the fact that it has a, it, it worsens the gender employment gap. Lots of other ones to consider. Just quickly, I think legislation helps. I think you need two sorts of legislation. You need the more general sort of public sector duty one, but it would also be nice to have something much more specific about budgeting, gender budgeting. Monitoring outside, I think, helps helps create pressure. There has been a problem in countries which have adopted gender budgeting legislation, specifically in trying to stop the gender, it just always telling you how wonderful the government's been doing. That's what outside monitoring can, can at least counteract, not necessarily prevent. It does need to be kept on the agenda. Um, and in particular, it needs to be seen as something you do for everything. Not, equality shouldn't be seen as an unaffordable luxury just when it's most needed. So there wasn't any gender analysis of the European Stability Pact which is what kept the euro going and plunged Greece into poverty. Um, nor has there been of the Brexit strategy in my country, despite both having manifest gender equality impacts. Um, I've got some stuff there about the specifics of what I think legislation on, on equality impact analysis should do. Um, but the main thing is it needs to be used, and it needs to be used at the right stages of policy formation. And it needs to apply to all policy, even the important ones. 